pray or? It's not time yet. Oh yeah, you're right, it's not. We've got five minutes. All right, guess it takes me five minutes to answer the quiz. <laughs> I need that five minutes. I'm going to start. All right, I, Mary just said if 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 I'm ready, uh, if she's if I'm ready, they're ready. So we're we're going to get started, friends. Well. 
Uh, welcome uh, to our Monday Night Bible class. We are continuing with Joshua. Pastor Steve's here today. Uh, and because he loves Nathan so much and he wants him to be heard, I am now handing him the microphone. <laughs> so for those of you watching online can appreciate the brilliance in this month that is available to us tonight. I, w I was hoping that you wouldn't have to listen to me this loudly, but... But this is true. I may need more help before the end of the night. We'll see. But fortunately for everyone, I am only doing the quiz tonight. So let, let's begin with a word of prayer and then we'll jump right on in. So, Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, Lord, and we thank you that um, you're faithful to us. Lord, you are a God of promises uh, and you are a promise keeping God. So, Lord, I pray that tonight as we explore your word, as we learn more about you, that we would grow uh, in grace, God, and we would grow um, in your provision. Lord, we thank you. Lord, make us uh, vessels uh, that not only receive your word, but Lord, that we distribute your word uh, through the way that we live our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, friends, we're going to get uh, started with the quiz. Um, I wrote this one out, so, uh, you know, hopefully you all did well on it. I, I thought it was pretty straightforward. We'll see. Uh, so Joseph's oldest son was, now if you remember, I, last week I started with chapter 17 only to realize that I was supposed to teach chapter 16 as well, so we backed up. But Joseph's oldest son was A, Benjamin, B, Manasseh, C, Simeon, D, Ephraim. This would have been covered in chapter 16. B is correct. It is Manasseh. Number two, the son received, uh, this son received the right hand blessing, A, Ephraim, B, Judah, C, Simeon, or D, Manasseh. That, actually, it was A. Now, you'll recall that, that this makes little sense because typically the right hand went on the firstborn and it conveyed the most. Remember, we say the right hand is a, the hand of blessing and wisdom and power. Well, typically, when you were going to pronounce a blessing, the oldest would get that right hand. But what happened in the story? The hands got reversed. And so uh, the left hand went on to Manasseh and the right hand on to Ephraim. And Ephraim was going to be greater than his uh, older brother. Number three, Joseph's two oldest sons were born in A, a cave, B, Egypt, C, Canaan, or D, Midian? It's B, Egypt. Yeah. What was Joseph doing in Egypt anyway? Anybody remember? He got sold in a multiple operation. He was all over the place, but he ended up being the second most powerful person in Egypt, and in some sense, the most powerful one, because the wisdom God gave him by giving him prophecy and insight uh, elevated him. So he was able to help his family, and um, well, God's people come through this famine, right? Number four, Zelophehad uh, had A, five sons, B, three sons, C, two sons, or D, no sons. Yes, that's right. No sons. You guys can't be fooled. And this was an interesting thing because he only had daughters, but God had made provision. They, they reminded them. Uh, Joshua, they said, do you remember? This was settled back with Moses. They didn't want uh, the family inheritance to just disappear or go to anyone. It wanted to, they wanted it to remain in the family. So what do you do when you have only daughters? Well, there was a provision for that. And God honored it, and Joshua honored it. Number five, Shechem was a... Um, was was a a type of monetary coin b city of refuge c levitical city d man of many talents oh i'm going to get you guys <laughs> yeah so the answer so shechem ends up being both a city of refuge and a levitical city if uh, if you study this out uh, that's a shekel. I, I did that. I did that on purpose. Uh, the, the, yeah, I, I'm, I try to be slick sometimes. I, I got you there. And talent sometimes can refer to money. So I just uh, six uh, among Joseph's descendants, intra -ter uh, territorial boundaries were 
A, firmly and sharply demarcated, uh, B, fluid, C, non-existent, or D, marked with stones? The answer is somewhat fluid. You will see that the lines that where they're divided are not exactly very uh, straight and clean. Sometimes it, you'll see a little bleed up into some territories and things like that. And because they're all on the same team, they weren't tried quite as strict as some. But that doesn't mean that there were no boundaries at all. There were. That's well. They. This is why they send surveyors in later, right? Uh, number seven. The Manassites complained because A, they were sick of manna, uh, B, they longed for meat, C, they didn't receive enough land, or D, they were not allowed to take Jericho's plunder. That's right, it is C. They're like, we're so many, we're such a great uh, people. And uh, Joshua was like, well, if you're so big, <laughs> there are so many of you, why don't you go clear the forest, drive these... Uh, giants out, if you will, and uh, well, well, we'll see later. Now, they weren't sick of manna, even though they were called the Manassites. Uh, do you remember who was sick of manna? The Hebrews, when they came across the Red Sea, God gave them manna, they wanted meat. Uh, he well, get in fairness, the Manassites were part of the Hebrews who came over, so some of them may have been Yes, but you notice what Pastor Nathan, Nathan does with his quiz right at the very top. He says, from within the context of our discussion, please choose the best answer or answers. I always have a, 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 a clause. Uh, number eight, the tribes of Joseph gave Joshua A, a bad report, B, a good report, C, a gift, D, a chariot of iron. It really was a bad report because here they say, well, we, we've got all these people, we need more land. But then they say, when Joseph tells them to, go, or Joshua tells them to go clear the land and, and this kind of thing, they're like, well, all the, these Rephaites, Rephaim, they're all, uh, they're there. And what are we going to do? You know, they, they, you're like, wouldn't they get it through their heads by now? If God says you can possess the land, you can possess the land. Uh, Joseph comes back, though, and he actually has a good report. He says that you're, well able, just kind of like way back in the beginning where he and Caleb both came back with good reports. He was confident that uh, Manasseh and Ephraim were able to take that land. Um, chariot of iron, no. Uh, remember we said that even though the peoples that they were afraid of, were, they might have had iron-clad chariots, they wouldn't have been fully iron chariots, just maybe some iron uh, around the wheels or something, but the answer is A. They had a bad report. Number nine, before the land was allotted, Joshua instructed the people to A, make a sacrifice, B, drive out the Jebusites, C, build a stone altar, or D, survey the land. Yeah, uh, they were called to be cartographers in a way. They were supposed to go out and they were going to do this before it really got divvied out. Um, it wasn't about making a sacrifice. And Why couldn't they drive out the, the Jebusites? They made an oath. <laughs> That's right. So uh, there, were, there was no driving them out at this point. Uh, and then number 10. Evidently, the Israelite camp moved to A, Gilgal, B, Shiloh, C, Jericho, D, Samaria. Yeah, it looks like it moved from Gilgal to Shiloh. And the reason, you know, we know that they'd set up camp. You can remember back to the time of Jericho in Gilgal. But now they have this meeting to divvy the land out. They're going to cast lots and uh, decide who gets what. But they're having a meeting in Shiloh, so it looks like that's where the camp is. And we'll give you a bonus one. Pastor Steve might be described as a person who A, loves weddings, B, likes to dress up, C, loves chain restaurants, or D, loves teaching. Oh, I think it's C, C and D. It's actually C and D. Yeah, you, you recall he he snuck in from the the wedding that he was attending uh, recently, and he was dressed up. But he was, you know, he's not always thrilled with that. And it's not that he's opposed to weddings; uh, he'll celebrate. But he likes teaching better. So I participated in one personally. Yeah, yeah. He's got one coming up with his daughter. So yeah. 
All right, well, I hope everyone did well. This is, uh, uh, I thought this was pretty straightforward. Was it hard? Did I make it hard? I got you with Shekel and, Sh and Shechem. But and there wasn't one question on the Nephilim. I was very impressed. Yeah. <laughs> All those giants are gone. That's right. Well, thank you, Pastor Nathan. And uh, first of all, um, I want to celebrate that Pastor Nathan's feeling a little better. He is not better. Keep praying for him. And uh, in some respects, he's on a medicine high, <laughs> you know, in terms of uh, taking care of some of the symptoms. But the reality is um, we would like the Lord to release Nathan completely from these kinds of ailments. He has had, uh, you know, significant and increasing hiatuses between uh, flare-ups and things like that. So uh, when one comes, it's, you know, frustrating. But uh, the Lord is gracious. And um, I frequently think of my own journey of dealing with Meniere's disease that uh, made me feel dizzy while I'm preaching and having to throw up almost uh, sometimes every day because of the vertigo that I would deal with. And then 2008, it just disappeared. And it was, a, you might remember me telling the story, a woman in our church had a word of prophecy and came up to me in November and said, Pastor Steve, the Lord told me that in the new year, you're going to uh, be done with Meniere's disease. And I thought, I hope you're right, but I didn't think or take it very seriously. And in the new year, that's exactly what the Lord did. So I am uh, full of gratitude that we do have a God who heals and brings about uh, that we need. That being said, if you read 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, I believe it is, Paul says all the things that he went through, stoned, left for dead, you know, uh, whipped and scourged and shipwrecked and then he says this that i have found that in my weakness i am strong sometimes god puts us in a tough journey to bring us to a place where we rely completely upon him and so always keep that in mind when you're going through a hardship nothing is an accident in terms of god's world god's perspective and uh, so he can heal or he can say, my grace is sufficient for you, which he said to Paul. Well, we already uh, prayed, and so I don't need to do that. I say that because I'm in such a the habit of praying. I'm like, maybe I should pray again, but we already prayed, and I'm sure that counts for, uh, for wherever we are. So I just came back from vacation in uh, Williamsburg, Virginia. Had a, a great time there. Brought my mom down, which was an uh, interesting challenge. Um, but she was able to go out to restaurants four times and uh, participate in a family birthday party. And so my feeling is just because you're 91 doesn't mean you stop living and I can squeeze as much life and excitement into her life as possible. And uh, I think it's good for me too. I shared with the Manhasset congregation yesterday that uh, the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, look at my patience and sometimes i lack patience and that's a quality i need to work on so the lord gave me my mom you know which when you care for somebody at a high level of care it requires patience it just does you know you're not running anywhere you're taking your time you're, you're doing what you need to do and so with that in mind um i take it as a, a privilege that the lord gives to care for somebody like that. But it was a good trip, but it's good to be back and uh, glad to be with you tonight. So I feel like I have a sneeze coming on. I think it went away. Good. If it comes back, I'll, I'll try not to put it in your direction. <laughs> All right. So tonight we have a, a passage which um, I've shared with you that uh, Ed Stetzer says to the preacher, Every passage you teach should be your favorite passage. It should be your favorite passage. Now, you're like, how is that possible? Well, you own it. You, like, get into it. But the first part of Joshua is so easy to teach. Be strong and courageous. Then we move into the conquests of Jericho and Rahab and her faith. And it's, like, exciting. It's adventurous. They deal with the, the sin uh, of, uh, the, of the people at, uh, what did you call that town? I always call it AI. I. 
Yes, there we go. Um, but, we, you know, we dealt with all that stuff. But then we came to the land allotments. And we are still in the land allotments. But tonight, we're going to deal with a philosophical question head on. And that relates to what's on the stage. Tell me what's on the stage that stinks, sticks out a little bit. A box. A box. What good? I mean, is it any kind of box? It's wrapping paper. So yes, I would, could be a gift. Do you just wrap wrapping things in your house and you know? No, it's, it's, it's more than a box. It looks like a present. I'll be specific what this box was. I can't, got up yesterday morning. What was yesterday? Anyone remember? Special day? Father's Day, Father's day yes. So I go, I uh, get up early because somebody preaching in Manhasset, and this box is sitting at my seat where I have breakfast. So it's, I pick it up, it's like super light. I'm like, huh, that's curious. So I pop open the top, open it, and whoosh, a balloon pops up. And it says, you know, Happy Father's Day, or, or Best Dad. I don't know exactly what it said, but it was a very nice thing, and it's now floating in my house. But I brought the box because in many respects, this will be symbolic of the issue that is at play in our passage today. Um, and we're going to get to that a little bit later and uh, deal with that on, I think, some very important issues that were clearly a factor for the people of Israel and I think a factor for you and I in our lives. And uh, our passage begins, chapter 19 of Joshua, with this statement, the allotment for Simeon, the allotment for Simeon. And um, I want to see here. I want to uh, just bring up on the map uh, behind us uh, the 12 tribes, you know, so you can just see it as we're talking a little bit about this. So it says here, the second lot came out for the tribe of Simeon. Now, when we say lots, we had talked a couple weeks ago at what these casting of lots may have involved. Does anyone remember? We said it was possibly related to something special. What was that? I don't know how to say it. The umum and the thumum. Yep. And we don't know this, but it's a speculative thing that seems biblically plausible that the priests would carry this under the breastplate. And we think one rock may have been uh, black, another rock may have been white. They might not have been rocks, it would have been bone or something else. But the, the bottom line is they were used to distinguish the will of God. So it was viewed that this would provide a means of where God's uh, decisions would be. Now, in the New Testament, just for fun, there was an important decision made with the casting of lots. Does anyone know what that decision was? Nathan, keep your hand down. What was that? Well, that's good. That is good. Yes. The, the answer was Jesus clothes. So that is possible. That's not, not the one I was thinking of, but I can't deny that is a good one. But there's another one that was used for, you know, the Romans cast lots for his clothing, but that wasn't a you might say, a Christian thing to do. But there was something else that was actually viewed as an appropriate means to make an extremely important decision. That's exactly right. Replace Judas. Do you remember who the replacement was? A guy named Matthias. So here's the great question that, you know, people who study the scriptures debate and discuss Matthias was chosen before the Holy Spirit came upon the church, which was on the cusp of happening. Because, I mean, they were told, tarry in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And while they're hanging out, somebody says, well, we need to replace Judas, so why don't we replace him? Let's cast lots. And they came up with a standard, somebody who's been with Jesus from the beginning and, you know, saw the whole thing. And so there are some scholars who say, well, the text says that they picked Matthias. We have no reason to say they shouldn't have picked Matthias. But there are others who say, yes, we do have a reason because Paul seems to have clearly been God's choice to replace Judas. And they did this before the Holy Spirit came. But that answer is speculative. 
So it's hard to say they were wrong, but when you look at the whole story, you say, I wonder why they didn't wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon the church. So it's just an interesting question. The point being, though, this idea of casting lots to find the de determining factors of the Lord, you know, what does the Lord have in mind, is in the Bible, both New Testament and Old Testament. And so when we see that, we realize, okay, that was nothing necessarily sinful, and it could have actually involved the um and the thum uh, that the priest would have. We don't know. It doesn't say. So the second lot came out for the tribe of Simeon. According to its clans, their inheritance lay within the territory of Judah. Now, this is interesting because here it is right now. There's Judah and there's Simeon smack in the middle. Sometimes you see uh, state borders and boundaries which look totally bizarre. Like you see uh, Michigan. Can you drive from the lower part of Michigan to the upper peninsula? You can't. I mean, you can't directly. You have to go down through Chicago, up through Wisconsin, and then over to the Upper Peninsula. And so the people ask, how did Michigan end up with the Upper Peninsula? Why isn't it part of Wisconsin? But it isn't. You know, it's just kind of the story of history. Delaware has this kind of funny thing where it has this little piece on the top of it. And you're like, how did that, you know, end up as part of Delaware and not something else? I watched a YouTube video of... Uh, uh, how state boundaries have changed over the years because the river has changed. You know how rivers kind of loop around and sometimes the erosion causes the river to break through, causing a new pathway for the river. And then lo and behold, you have a part of one state that's in the middle of another state. And, and they're small things, but it's like, how did that happen? Well, Simeon is this category. So Simeon, as a tribe, needs some place to be. So it mentions these towns, uh, Beersheba, Malata, Hazar, Shul. I'm not going to read them all. And I'm going to go a little bit closer here so you can see it. This is a closer picture of Simeon. And you may wonder, when they make these maps in Bible software or in the back of your Bible, how do they come up with these borders? I mean, it's not like we have an ancient map hanging around. What they do is they look at the names of the towns. And so what they do, if, the, if we know historically where these towns are, they plot them out. And then they make a decision, this is what we'll put on the map called Simeon, the tribe of Simeon, because these towns are mentioned. Now, did Simeon actually cut across like this? We don't know. They, they you know, they, for symmetry, they make it a, a circle. But we do know this. In biblical history, Simeon as a tribe, or Simeonites, if you want to call them, they had a responsibility for defending the southern border of Israel, or more specifically, the tribe of Judah. And so that's where they settled. So that's where our map makers put Simeon. They look at the names that are listed here. So it's actually fascinating to me to see how do they come up with a map like this? You just look at these names and then they study archaeology and they say, do we know where these towns are? And sometimes the towns survive to this day in some respect. Other times they do not. But this gives us a picture of where they were. So it goes through all these areas. And this bottom area here is the Negev. So does the Negev ring a bell as to what kind of land it is? Desert. It's desert. This past week, by the way, was one of those moments where I thought, I bought a house in the desert. Because as you guys know, I bought a house in Henderson, Nevada. My daughter's going to live in it when she gets married. Well, she's in it now. It was 117 degrees last week. 117 <laughs> degrees. It was, I was at the record temperature. That's, I think that was the highest it's ever been. It was that high in like 1940 or something. But I'm like, whoa. So I asked my daughter, is the air conditioning working? <laughs> and she said, oh yeah, everything's working fine. It's actually a little cool in here. And uh, they said, well then raise the thermostat. I'm paying for this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, adjusted it a little bit. But 
that's the desert. So when you go to that part of Israel today, even it is not, I mean, it's beautiful as in desert beauty, but it's not something you think of like growing crops or anything like that. It's pretty barren land uh, that they have uh, settled in. So they go on here, verse, uh, the end of verse eight, this was the inheritance of the tribe of the Simeonites according to its clans. The inheritance of the Simeonites was taken from the share of Judah. So Judah was originally given this land because Judah's portion was more than they needed. So the Simeonites received their inheritance within the territory of Judah. I find that interesting in the sense that, okay, Judah had more than they needed, so some was taken and given to someone else. That from, a, let's say this was my quiet time in the morning. I have my cup of coffee and I'm reading this. That one little phrase probably would be something I would underlight in my morning quiet time. Because I would think to myself, do I have more than I need? Now, ask yourself that question. Do you have more than you need? Most of us kind of recognize we do have more than we need. And so it's a good assessment to say, Lord, are you reminding me in today's quiet time that I should be generous, that I should be you know, giving something away or something like that? The scripture doesn't tell us how happy Judah was about this you know, as a tribe, but it seems to make sense from the size of the tribe of Judah in terms of the land that was allotted to them. But that's an example where I think you're on good hermeneutical ground. Hermeneutics meaning the study of interpretation. You're on good interpretive ground to say there is such a thing as having more than you need. And that there could be an appropriate response to having more than you need. Uh, one interesting thing I deal with in living in a parsonage, which the church grants me as part of my salary package, but when I had a kid move to Nevada, I had an extra room. I felt, this is God's house. I shouldn't have an extra room. So I, I can't rent it because it belongs to the church. And it, you know, so I can't make money off it. So ever since my daughter moved, we just fill it in with somebody who needs a house for free. Now, we want them to be a decent person. I thought you have some place to live. <laughs> but anyway, we have had it continuously occupied by people who need some place to live. And I think it's a healthy mindset to think, Lord, I have this. Is there anyone who could use it? Just this past few weeks ago, I was reminded of uh, when I lived in Illinois, I met this young woman going to Wheaton College. Her passion was to bring the gospel to the Muslim people. And her ultimate goal was to go to Turkey to do it. And can you go to the Middle East and officially present the gospel to people? The answer is generally no, you cannot. Even the nicer countries, Dubai, Jordan, you can't do that. It's, it's against the law. So when I see a young woman who says, I will go wherever the Lord calls me, and she needed a way to get into New York City because she wanted to integrate with the Muslim community did I say New York City? I meant Chicago. She wanted to go into Chicago and interact with the Muslim community. And she would dress in traditional Muslim garb. And every Saturday, she would come to my house and I would give her the keys to my car. And she would drive into Chicago. She's a college student. She didn't have a car. And it was a joy to do that. I, w I have two cars. I was not using both cars on a Saturday. So it's one of those moments where you think to yourself, is this a moment I have more than I need and I can grant somebody else something? And the other cool thing is if you build a, a spirit of generosity, I think the Lord brings it right back to you where people are kind to you and, and reflect that kindness in your choices. So that would be my little quiet time thought on that first little section here on allotment for Simeon which brings us to the allotment for Zebulun. Zebulun. A third lot came up for Zebulun, according to its clans, the boundary of the inheritance as far as Sarid, going west, and then it lists the various places. I love the way it says, toward the sunrise um, in verse 12. 
Then it continued, verse 13, eastward to Gath Hefer and Eth Gazin and out to Rimeon towards uh, Nia. Now, let me move to this next map, which highlights the northern section. So where is Zebulun on this map? It is this purple thing right over here. So where is north, south, east, west? So that's south, north, anyone help? Which is that? Okay. So when it says towards the sunrise, it tells you, you know, where it's referring to. So, you know, coming over here. Um, so that's where the lot fell for Zebulun. Um, and it says here, verse 14, their boundary went around the north to Hanath and ended up in the valley of Iftah, included, again, various other names. Now, one of the names sticks out, Bethlehem. So this is where Jesus was born. Yes? No? That's a trick question, of course. He was not born there. <laughs> he was born in Bethlehem. That is over here. <laughs> Bethlehem, as the prophet said, Ephrathah. There's more than one Bethlehem. That's why the prophet had to specify that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Not Zebulun's at Bethlehem. Tri trivia question. The word is in two words in Hebrew, Bethlehem. Does anyone know what it means? Bet, you see this all the time in synagogues. They will spell it on the sign Beth, B-E-T-H. But pronunciation-wise, it's B-E-I-T. It means house. So what you will see, Bet Israel, house of Israel. Rahem actually means bread. So it's a house of bread. And back in the ancient world, when you named your town that way, that probably means they grew wheat, you know, that or some kind of barley or something that could be made into some kind of meal for bread. So uh, that's just a you know trivia thing. And and back in the day, Bethlehem was the bread basket of Jerusalem. Bethlehem is only five miles from Jerusalem, and so that is where they grew the crops for feeding the people in Jerusalem. By the time Jesus comes along, it wasn't known for growing crops. It was known for raising sheep. And they became the sheep that would be used for sacrifice for the Passover. So that is just noteworthy, different Bethlehem. There were 12 towns and villages. Now, how do we know where Zebulun is? All they do is look for the names of those cities. Where do we know those cities are? And then they draw kind of a line around it and they say, this would be Zebulun, which moves the allotment for Issachar, Issachar. Now, I'm going to pause here for just one moment. The pastor Nathan mentioned next week, last week about alternative information about these various tribes and how we get it from Genesis. Did anyone remember that? I, can't, I didn't listen to what he said last week, so I don't know if he said it. But this is fascinating on extra study. I, I didn't copy the section down. It would have been copying a whole chapter. But in Genesis 49, something happens. And the reason why I mentioned it is because Nathan referred to it in his quiz. So Jacob is blessing his kids. And when he came to Joseph's sons, he goes like this. And Joseph says, Dad, Dad, you got it all wrong. It goes like this. And Jacob goes, no, I have it right. And he goes like this. That's from Genesis 49. And why this is important, for example, when Jacob is blessing Judah, he says, the scepter will never depart from your tribe. Now, we know ultimately Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah. He is the lion of Judah. In fact, in Genesis 49, J J Jacob says to Judah, you are a lion's cub. And so that's why Jesus is the lion of Judah. But the idea of the scepter never departing from Judah 
that also conveys that Judah is going to be the seat of government. Ultimately, you know, it's going to be Jerusalem and all that will be associated with Judah. So when you're looking at these tribal allotments, it is also fascinating to study what did Jacob say prophetically about these various tribes. Now, one of the things relating to Zebulun, right here, that he says, is that you will be on the shore. Does that look like it's on the shore? Doesn't look like it to me that it's on the shore. Which gets back to this baby over here, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, the present that's sitting there. We'll get to that a little bit later. So let's go to Issachar. The fourth law came to Issachar according to its clans, the territory included, a bunch of names that Steve does not want to pronounce. And then it ended at the Jordan. There were 16 towns and villages. So there's Issachar right there. Because it tells us it ends at the Jordan, here's the Jordan River. It goes from the Sea of Galilee right down all the way to the Dead Sea. So we know, based on the text, that it included these towns. And so it has to be in that basic shape. Thus, the map makers in your Bible, look at where the towns are, draw a line, color it. That's how we know where Issachar was. I wish we had the survey maps that, you know, Joshua commissioned, but we do not have those maps. Verse 23, these towns and their villages were the inheritance of the tribe of Issachar according to its clans. Next one. Allotment for Asher. So, Let's see Asher on this map. There you go. It's a pretty good piece of land. I want to notice way up here is Tyre. That is a very wealthy trade city. And then all the way down here. And what we read, the fifth lot came for the tribe of Asher according to its clans. Their territory included a bunch of names that Steve doesn't want to pronounce. And then it turned east, verse 27, to Beth Dagon touched Zebulun and the valley of Iptael and went north to Beth Emek, uh, so on and so forth. Verse 29, the boundary then turned back up north to Ramah and went to the fortified city of Tyre toward Hosa and came out at the Mediterranean Sea in the region of Aksib. There were 22 towns in their villages. These towns in their villages were the inheritance of the tribe of Asher according to its clans. All right. Every time I'm reading this, so some Bible software person, some map maker is writing down the names of these towns, plotting them out, and drawing a color picture like we have behind us. So that's where the tribe of Asher was. Okay. There's a reason I'm being redundant here and repeating this over and over again. Allotment for Dan. The seventh lot came for Dan according to its clans. The territory of their inheritance included a bunch of names that Pastor Steve does not want to pronounce. Verse 46, Majarkin, Rakan, and the area facing Joppa. And then, so right here, when you map that out, here's Dan, way down here. So here's Judah, this part here. Simeon is just a little below. Dan, Ephraim, Benjamin. Anyway, you see what's going on. Now, we have a little parenthetical statement that shows up here. This statement is very important for this present that is behind me. It's not the whole story. I'm not going to tell you yet why that present is behind me, but it's part of the story. Here's what we read. When the territory of the Danites was lost to them, hmm, lost to them? Who did they lose it to? They couldn't find it? Honey, do you know where we live? <laughs> okay. They went up and attacked Leshem, took it, put it to the sword, and occupied it. They settled in Leshem and named it Dan after their ancestor. These towns were the inheritance of the tribe of Dan, according to its clans. Now, that little parenthetical statement 
Very intriguing because in the book of Judges, which takes place after this, we, this story is told. Here's part of the story. So this is Judges 18. So it's the next book in our Bible. In those days, Israel had no king. That's a repeated theme all through the book of Judges. In those days, Israel had no king. Another phrase that shows them in the book of Judges, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. You know, it's just kind of like the sign of the time. Actually, you could say that in our country right now. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. We, we live in the book of Judges right now. So here's what it says. And in those days, the tribe of the Danites was seeking a place of their own where they might settle because they had not yet come into inheritance among the tribes of Israel. Now, based on what you just read in Joshua, did they have a place of inheritance? We saw the list of all the towns. They had that place. You know, going back over here again, this is a different map, but there it is. That's where those towns are. You had a place. So we're, we're now into uh, Judges. And it says, so the Danites sent out, sent five of their leading men to Zorah and Ashtol to spy out the land and explore it. These men represented all the Danites. They told them, go and explore the land. Now, I didn't copy the whole passage. I just wanted to give you a little sample of it. But what this passage is ultimately telling us, let me see if I can get a bigger map here. Okay. So this is Israel under David. It's just two map makers showing you the same maps here. So over here is, let's see if it's a bigger picture here. Anyway, here is Dan, right there. Here's where, in our map of the tribes, where Dan is supposed to be, right over here. But that's where it ends up, right there. Huh? So if you look at any map that of Israel, you'll see Dan above the Sea of Galilee. I had the chance to visit there a year and a half ago. Cool place. Um, and uh, that's where they found, by the way, the archaeological evidence of King David truly existing in history. They found a stone written by one of David's enemies that said, I am at war with the house of David. It was found in Dan. But then one scratches one's head. If the tribal allotment is here, how did they end up there? Hmm. Curious. All right, well, here's the other interesting thing with this passage. Whoever wrote the book of Joshua knows the story of what happened later, which is recorded in Judges 18. So in other words, this didn't happen yet. This is going to happen much later. But the story is included here as in parenthetical reference, which, by the way, is a hint that all of Joshua was not clearly not written by Joshua. Some of it was clearly written by him. Some of it is written by somebody who lived in the time of the judges. Because remember the phrase that shows up in Joshua all the time? These rocks are here till this day. So it's probably referring to the rocks are still here in the time of the judges, that they, they have that. All right, we're going to get back to that later because this is so, so important and applies to you and me. Allotment for Joshua. So he's not a tribe, but you know what? After all, he was the leader, the guy who brought them into the promised land here. So he should get his allotment. Actually, the Lord promised he would get an allotment. This was promised in Numbers 14 that because he was faithful and, and didn't think with the spies, remember how 10 spies came back and said, we can't take the land. But Joshua and Caleb said, let's go for it. He was promised, you will have land. While well, all the other spies died in the wilderness, but not him. When they had finished dividing the land into its allotted portions, the Israelites gave Joshua, son of Nun, an inheritance among them as the Lord commanded. They gave him a town he asked for, Timnath, Sarah, in the hill country of Ephraim, and he built up the town and settled there. Now, so where is this? So, 
This is located right over here. So this is Ephraim, and right there is the town. It's not on the map. We're talking a little tiny town that we do not have the exact location, but it is right in this vicinity. Now, the seat of power that Nathan was just talking about a little while ago is Shiloh over here. Jerusalem, which will be conquered, is over here. He is nowhere near the seat of power. So here's what scholars think. Joshua moved to Florida. You know what I mean by that? He retired. So when he went to his allotment, he did not feel like he wanted to be in the, you know, the place. You know, George Bush, he went to Cunningbunkport, Maine. You know, he's not near Washington. He's like not engaged with anymore. You know, uh, you know, some people do that, some people don't. But in any case, that's what scholars think that he picked a town kind of out of the way in the mountains. And if you recall, we have talked about this already. The scripture says that he was stricken in years. He did not feel like a spring chicken anymore. You know, he was not doing that great. Caleb was doing great physically. Joshua, he wanted to slow down. So the speculation is that's why he didn't settle in like Shiloh or Gilgal, but he settled in some place that he just thought was probably beautiful, quiet, a place where he could uh, relax. Everything I just said just now is pure speculation. It's just looking at where he settled and said, you know, I mean, if you read, you know, Donald Trump leaves office and he's now living in Anchorage, Alaska, you would probably say, I guess he's done. <laughs> you know, he doesn't want to get engaged. He didn't do that. <laughs> but my, my simple point is you can tell where people's level of interest is by where they move to. You know, where, what is their engagement level? What do they have plans for? All right, so that's where uh, Joshua heads out. These are the territories of Eliezer the priest, Joshua, son of Nun, and the heads of the tribal clans of Israel, assigned by Lot at Shiloh in the presence of the Lord at the entrance of the tent meeting, which makes me think the Umum and the Thumum, because that was something at the, the temple that they, they did. And so they finished dividing the land. However, when it comes to how they should conduct themselves in their new land, what is their guide to try to figure out how they should live in this new land? Help me think through this. What would that guide be? Good, Ten Commandments, that's close. The reason I say it's close is because that's part of the book of the law. But you know what I appreciate deeply is now they realize, now that we have allotted the land, the law said we're supposed to have some things. One of them is cities of refuge. Now what in the world is a city of refuge? Well, let me give you a modern day example of that we live in the United States. You don't agree with it, but you may agree with it, you may disagree with it. We have sanctuary cities. Now, what is a sanctuary city? It is a city like San Francisco that has made the official decision, we will not help the federal government round up undocumented residents. While other cities, they say, no, it's our responsibility as Americans, we will help the federal government in doing that. So if somebody in San Francisco is arrested for car theft, let's say, they might have to deal with the car theft arrest, but in other cities, their name would also be brought to the feds who would deport them. It's like, well, we don't have to pay for their prison. Send them to wherever they came from. And that became a city of, a sanctuary city. A city of refuge is not quite like that, but it's in the same vein. So, Wilson, you are uh, helping to roof a house with a partner. So the two of you have a pretty substantial job. And you are working with a man who supports a family of six. And he slips and falls off the roof, dies 
I mean, it's tragedy. In the ancient world, whoever that man is related to would have the role of kinsman redeemer. Or, you could cook it another way, that's a positive way of saying it, the right of revenge. I don't know what you did, Wilson, but my friend fell off the roof, you're going to have the same penalty that they had. But you're like, it was because he was careless. I mean, you know. So what they did when there was an unintentional death of some sort, they set up cities to run to. And once you are in the city, no one can touch you. And so what it means that if that person tried to pursue Wilson to the city of refuge, they would be at punishment if you attack somebody. So the city of refuge doesn't mean you're off the hook. It just means that now you're going to go before a judge. And the judge says, uh, Wilson, what exactly happened? Well, he had grease on the bottom of his shoes. I told him to replace his shoes. He, he did not replace his shoes. And he slipped and he fell off the roof. The judge goes, case in favor of Wilson, turns to the other guy, family, the kinsman redeemer, and says, I, I understand your grief. We feel very sorry for you. But Wilson can return in safety to his home because he did the right thing. On the other hand, if Wilson was found guilty, then there would be a tribunal to decide what kind of punishment he would have. So what you see in this Cities of Refuge, which is the beginning of chapter 20, it, it's telling you, <coughs> excuse me, first of all, where they're getting this from, which is Numbers 35 and verses 6 to 34 is where it talks about the cities of refuge. And so it's going to say, and this is what I think is so cool about this section, how should you live your life? Well, why don't we open the Bible and find out? I wish people would do that these days. You know, and people, you know, say to me, Pastor Steve, I'm really wondering, is it God's will that I keep living with my boyfriend? No, it's not. Wow, God speaks to you just like that? Yes, he does. How does he do it? I opened my Bible and it says I should not live with my boyfriend. You know, I, I was able to figure this out because it says that unless I am married, I am in a fornicating relationship. Therefore, I have God's will for you. Isn't that wonderful? I got it like that. Now, when it comes to should I go to this college or that college, pray about that. Ask people's advice. But when it's black and white in the scripture, you know, my wife is so unlovable. Should I love her? You know, yeah, you should. Did anyone come to the uh, uh, volunteer appreciation night? Fanny definitely did. So you have the volunteer appreciation night. So they needed some staff to do this like uh, talent show thing. And so I thought, um, well, I have this stupid video of me in, the van, uh, in this band in 1983 singing Pretty Woman, the Van Halen version. <laughs> pretty woman walking down that street, pretty woman. So anyway, back in the day, when, so we showed the video of thin, full hair Steve singing this at age 21, while fat, bald Steve sang it here on the stage. You know, it was just kind of fun to do it. But back, when you look at the video, I am clearly looking at cute girls in the front row. You know, so I'm going, pretty woman, walking down that street. But I thought, if I'm going to relive this, I need to find somebody to sing to. And if that person, that woman, is like my age, attractive looking, wrong person to sing to. <laughs> wrong person to sing to. But if it was like a seven-year-old girl, could be cute, you know, singing to that. But I found Roberta. And Roberta was sitting right where you were sitting. So I came over and I said, Roberta, come on over here. Roberta, she's in her 80s, probably. She's, she's up there. Um, and I sat her right here in this seat. And so I sang, pretty woman walking down the street. And uh, several women came up to me afterwards and said, you chose the right person. 
<laughs> Meaning, you better respect your wife. Because women in particular, they have the radar out. They want to see that a husband respects his wife. And so yesterday I'm in Manhasset. And I am, uh, you know, in the worship, I'm in the back, and uh, uh, Jenny Chang was near me, and she's the one who ran the, the evening for the volunteer appreciation thing, and Michelle is walking in the room, and she goes, look, here comes a pretty woman. And it's like, yes, she is. <laughs> so when my wife walked in, you know, Jenny's like, hey, there's a pretty woman for you. And uh, so it was very cute and very responsive. All this to say that I appreciate the fact that when they had the land, they opened their Bibles and they said, what's the next thing we need to do? We need cities of refuge. Now, I want to point out something before this section began. Verse 51 ended what's called an inclusio. We had talked about this, I think it was about a month ago, that there was a paragraph in the beginning of the section that sounded very similar to a paragraph at the end of the section, and I want to show it to you again. So where are we now? Okay, here we are. So here is Joshua 14 when we began the section. Now these are the areas of the Israelites received as an inheritance in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest, Joshua, son of Nun, and the heads of the tribal clans of Israel allotted to them. Now we just finished reading in chapter 19 these words. These are the territories that Eleazar the priest, Joshua son of Nun, and the heads of the tribal clans of Israel assigned by Lot at Shiloh in the presence of the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and so they finished dividing the land. The two sections are very similar. Chapter 14, chapter 19. That tells us as readers that that is one section. So when we began that section, we were beginning a section of so-and-so gets this land, so-and-so gets that land, so-and-so gets this land. And then when we finish that section, it repeats the same paragraph. So that is a way in ancient writing that it tells you that you might say that was the end of the chapter. It's, it's a way they would, you might say, give your bookends, a bookend on one end and a bookend on the other. It's, it's helpful as students of the Bible to see how they reach that uh, conclusion. So let's look at this next section. Then the Lord said to Joshua, chapter 20, verse 1. Every time I read something like that, I pause for a second with curiosity. What do you think I'm curious about? How did the Lord tell Joshua? I say frequently in this class and when I'm preaching, I felt the Lord say to me, dot, dot, dot. And I think it would be a fair question for somebody to say, how did the Lord say that to you, Steve? I want to hear from the Lord. He hasn't talked to me recently. Why is he always talking to you? What is he saying? How does he say it? Well, in my world, there are usually places that I hear from him because I'm listening. One is when I'm jogging. I'm away from all my media, you know, all that kind of stuff. I'm jogging. It's me and the Lord. And as I'm jogging, I ask the Lord, Lord, I don't really know how to end Sunday's message. I have this idea. I don't feel comfortable with it. And, and then, boom, I feel in my mind go in this direction. And I go, thank you, Lord. That works. I like that. And by the time I'm home, I write it out and, you know, finish. I have that happen all the time. And I genuinely feel that the Holy Spirit is bringing that to me and speaking it and making it feel right in my heart that that is what I should do. There are other times when I read scripture and, a page, and something leaps from the page and I feel, oh, I think the Lord's talk, talking to me that way. But in the biblically wor biblical world, when it says this, then the Lord said to Joshua, this could be hmm, a couple things. One is, what book did Joshua probably have at his access? The book of Numbers. 
in which he read in Numbers 35, 6 to 34, when Israel occupies the land, they are to set up cities of refuge. That may be as simple of interpretation as it is. He read his Bible and he goes, my goodness, now that we got the land, we're supposed to set up cities of refuge. I point this out for this very simple reason. So many of us are waiting for, you know, may nay, may nay, tekel parson to be written on the wall of our house. Marry this person. Oh, maybe I should marry this person. Somebody came up to my wife just last week. How did you know that Steve was the right one to marry? That's a fair question. How did you know? But my wife knew this person, knew her life. And she said, well, you're not necessarily knowing conclusively, but I did know I should marry a Christian. She's dating a Muslim. So Michelle's response was, you look at all the pieces, and one of the things that I read in Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Now, there are Christians who marry an unbeliever, and thank God the spouse comes to faith, but it's not recommended. If you do marry an unbeliever, Paul says, stay in the marriage, love them, be respectful of them, lead them to Christ if you can. But Paul says, if you can avoid it, avoid it. And so there is sometimes when you're wondering how, if somebody ever asks you, how do you hear from the Lord? Ask the next question. When was the last time you read this book, the Bible? And are you listening to the Lord speak to you? I think it is very possible where the Lord spoke to Joshua was in his personal quiet time. And he read that day, Numbers 35, and he goes, oh boy, we got to set up some stuff. Now that's one possibility. Number two, how did God speak in the ancient world to kings, to priests, to people? A particular role that shows up all the time in the Hebrew scriptures. Judges, well, could be. Prophets. So a prophet comes up, Elijah, uh, you remember Elijah goes, uh, excuse me, Jehoshaphat goes to Ahab. Do you have any prophets of the Lord here? And Ahab's response, yeah, we do. He always gives me bad news. I don't like hearing from him. Well, there were prophets amongst the people, as there really are today too. I think there are prophets that people don't even know they're being prophetic. They're just feeling like something, God has placed something in their heart and they share it. I've shared the story. I was 19 years old at a church meeting in Douglaston and uh, Danny Spasta was the pastor of this. I didn't know Danny would one day be a part of a church that I would be pastor of, but he was the pastor of this little church, 25 people. I went there only because my girlfriend went there. 19 years old, a woman comes up to me and prophesies over me. I'm like, who are you and why are you getting close to my personal space? I mean, this is what I was feeling. Here's what she said. You are going to be a teacher of my people. Therefore, prepare now for the work that I have for you. Do, 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 do. You have entered the twilight zone. I did want to be a pastor someday. Nobody knew that. And here a stranger communicates an affirmation of my calling. So that can be another way that somebody spoke to Joshua. But you know what it could have been? Somebody may not have begun the conversation with, thus saith the Lord. Somebody might have started the conversation with Joshua and says, hey, Joshua, doesn't the book of the law say that we're supposed to set up ref cities of refuge? And he goes, oh boy, you were right. Thank goodness the Lord told you to say that to me. To which the person says, I didn't actually hear the Lord say that. I just know that it says it in the book. There are so many ways that God communicates. Could it be that he had a dream? Possible. Could he have a vision? Possible. Could he have heard an audible voice? Possible. But you know, what I've observed with the Lord is that sometimes it's as simple 
as reading the Bible and that loving friend who speaks biblical truth to you. That is often how the Lord speaks. You know the old joke about the person who is in Alabama or something and their house is you know, being saturated with a flood and he says, God save me. He's on the roof of his house and a, a boat comes by and says, you want to get in? And he says, no, I'm waiting for the Lord to save me. And then a, then a helicopter comes by and says, you want to get in? And he says, no, I'm waiting for the Lord to save me. Anyway, the end of the story is he dies in the flood. And when he gets to St. Peter, he says, why didn't you save me? He says, I sent you three people to, send, to save you. Sometimes don't look for the super supernatural response. Look for the very simple, practical response as the way the word speaks. So here's what we read. Tell the Israelites to designate cities of refuge as I instructed you through Moses so that everyone who kills a person accidentally, got to watch out for those Wilsons, you know, not watching out for those roofers there, unintentionally may flee there and find protection from, here is the opposite of the kinsman redeemer, the avenger of blood. When they flee to one of these cities, they are to stand at the entrance of the city gate, state their case before the elders of the city. Then the elders are to admit the fugitive into their city, provide a place to live among them. If the avenger of blood comes in pursuit, the elders must not surrender the fugitive because the fugitive killed their neighbor unintentionally and without malice aforethought. They are to stay in that city until they have stood trial before the assembly until the death of the high priest uh, who is serving at that time. Then they may go back to their own home in the town in which they fled. Now, very simple. They have protection. And what this means is that God set up a system for justice. Now, one of the things that I will admit that I fully don't understand is the timeline of waiting for the death of the high priest. I mean, let's just say the year is 1952 and the law says, wait for the death of the queen. She's still hanging on. <laughs> How old is Queen Elizabeth? Like 94, 93, you know, her mother lived to 100 something. And so and she's still competent. You know, She's an amazing woman. But anyway, the idea of waiting for the death of the high priest is like kind of strange to me. I don't I don't understand that one. I can't pontificate on it. I don't really know, except to say that's what the text says, that they are to wait uh, till then. But the whole point is you're supposed to receive justice. It is not saying to the person seeking to avenge blood that they're wrong. Maybe they are deserving to avenge blood, but it has to go to trial. This idea of taking a random act of vengeance is not biblical, is not appropriate, and uh, should not take place. So they set apart Kadesh in Galilee, in the hill country of Naphtali, Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, and Kirith Arba, that is Hebron, in the hill country of Judah. So they set aside three different places for this purpose. On the other side from Jericho, which means on the land on the other side of the Jordan. They had set up Bezer in the wilderness on the plateau in the tribe of Reuben, Ramoth in, in Gilead and in the tribe of Gad, and Golan in Bashan in the tribe of Manasseh. So I can show you a map of these uh, fortified cities. The map is, it's, the problem is it's too small, but right there it says cities of refuge and you can see a red dot. So there's a red dot, there's a red dot, there's a red dot, there's one, there's one, there's one. Do you notice how they're distributed across the land? It is the idea that if you had your accidental death over here, you could go here. If you had your accidental death over here, you can go here. Accidental death over here, you can go down there. So the idea is that there is some place not too far that you could go to seek refuge. Um, now, there is in this a sad commentary. So how many cities of refuge did he designate on the west side of the Jordan? Three, perfect, good. 
Now here's what Deuteronomy says. So we're into the law. If the Lord your God enlarges your territory as he promised on oath to your ancestors and, and gives you the whole land he promised them because you carefully follow these laws I command you today to love the Lord your God and walk in obedience to him, then you are to set aside three more cities. So, they set aside three. If they get all the land, they're supposed to set aside three more. That These, by the way, were not included, the one on the other side of the Jordan. The reason why this is interesting and somewhat depressing and relates to this box is because it wasn't necessary. It wasn't necessary for them to grant three more cities because they didn't get the other land. So why set aside the extra cities of refuge? But that was available to them. So we move on, verse 9. Any of the Israelites or any foreigner residing among them who killed somebody accidentally could flee to these designated cities and not be killed by an avenger of blood prior to standing trial before the assembly. Now, an allotment for the Levites. We read this. Now, the family heads of the Levites approach Eliezer the priest. So he's their boss, because the Levites are the priestly caste. And they say, by the way, if you're Jewish and your last name is Levi, people think that they are descendants of the Levites. So, interesting thing to note. Um, they came to Joshua, son of Nun, the heads of the tribal families of Israel, at Shiloh and Canaan, and said to them, The Lord commanded through Moses that you give us towns to live in, with pasture lands for our livestock. So, as the Lord had commanded, the Israelites gave the Levites the following towns and pasture lands out of their own inheritance. Now, we are entering a section that I am not going to read these 4,000 names because they gave them lots of towns. Now, here is the thing. They were given towns distributed all, all over Israel because the priests did not have an inheritance of their own. The Lord is their inheritance. That's the way the scripture always said, the Lord is their inheritance. So they're to live in everyone else's town and be given the opportunity to have their families and graves and you know places where they can raise their families. So this map you have on the screen has another category. Right here it's the cities of refuge, but if I go over here it says Levites cities, Levite cities, that's a green dot. And if you notice this map is filled with green dots all over the place. That's the listing of all these cities. That's where the Levites are. So once again, you see them distributed well around the community of Israel. And uh, it tells them, you know, in each area. And if you notice, when if we read through each of these cities, it'll mention in Zebulun, here's their city. In, in uh, Issachar, this is their city, and it goes right down. Verse 40 is where I want to drop back in again. The towns of the Levites, excuse me, the total number of towns allotted to the Marianne clans were the rest of the Levites came to 12. The towns of the Levites in the territory held by the Israelites were 48 in all, together with pasture lands. Each of these towns had pasture lands surrounding it, this was true of all these towns. Now, let me find the scripture that I want to read out loud. Okay, here we are. This is an extremely important scripture. One of the most important in the entire book of Joshua. All right, are you ready? This is where you get your money's worth right here tonight. So the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give their ancestors, and they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn their ancestors. Not one of their enemies withstood them. The Lord gave all 
their enemies into their hands. Not one of the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. Okay, wow, that's powerful. The Lord's promises are fulfilled. Now, let me show you the depressing map. On the left, everything we just went through over the last several weeks. Zebulun, here's your land. Go for it. So, Zebulun, did you go for it? Not really. We didn't go for it. Um, Asher, here's your land right here. See Asher over there? No, they didn't go for it. Dan, here's your land over here. There's, there's Dan right there. It's kind of hard. Let's take the city up here. They look like nice people. And we'll take that one. What you have in this passage is attention. The author of the book of Joshua, whoever he may be, he knows this. God said, be strong and courageous. Every place you place your foot, it will be yours. But what does Moses say in Deuteronomy? The Lord will grant you other land if you honor the love of the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. Keep my covenant amongst you. What you have is, so it, it's Christmas time. In this box, or let's say it's Father's Day, since that was a Father's Day box. And I received this, you know, lovely present from my daughter. Very cool. Awesome. But I never open it. It's still sitting there. And I'm now 82 years old. The present I received from Father's Day 2021, I never opened it. I am now 87 years old on my deathbed, and I never opened the present. And then I die. And then somebody says, I wonder what dad had in that present. We open it up and it says that I, I have a, a land available to me. I am going to be this inheritance of something amazing. Wow. And dad never opened that present. I was in the Westbury campus and Pastor Corey was preaching. And uh, he says his wife lots, likes to watch the old TV show Monk. And if you ever watch the story of Monk, you know, he's this uh, OCD detective kind of thing. But his wife died tragically, and she gave him a Christmas present that um, he never could open after she died. So he had this wrapped present because to him, it kind of mentioned, meant that she's still alive if he never opens his present. Well, at the end of the series, after, you know, seven seasons, whatever, he decides to open the present. And it's who his wife's killer is. In other words, she was giving him the clue. If I, the present said, if I do not come home, this, the fact that you're opening this present, it means that I didn't come home. And um, this is the person I think who killed me. And all this time, he could not find the person who killed his wife. And he had it all along and never opened the present and never knew. Here is the powerful message of this paragraph, which the author of Joshua knows. Joshua knows. I mean, he is including in this, Dan didn't take the land because it was different. They lost it, remember? They couldn't find it. They didn't know where it was. So they took something they thought was more convenient, about 80 miles north, you know, as to what would be. And that's what they took. When you look at that map, to me, it depresses me, but it also excites me. Because here's what we find. Remember when Joshua took on the five kings in the south, whips them. They don't even mention any casualties. Then when they take on the northern kings, whips them. They don't even mention any casualties. It was like wherever they went. Remember the Lord sent down hail? 
And more people died from the hail than came from the swords of, of Joshua. It was as if Israel was given this and they said, it's too hard. I don't want to open that present. I'm afraid to open that present. And they didn't. What I get from this passage is an indictment on us and a hope for us. Here's the hope. God fulfills his promises. Every one of them. Every place you place your foot will be yours. Every time they did that, that's what happened. But you got to step forward in faith. You got to believe that the Lord is going to provide what he says he's going to provide. This to me is uh, an interesting thing. You know, I take you back to a staff meeting. Um, I guess it was probably 2006, maybe 2007. And we were coming up with the vision statement for the church. So all the staff are contributing. And this is, and it was something like this. The vision of Shelter Rock Church is to provide uh, uh, an environment of, of like impassioned worship before the Lord in, a, in an environment of excellence through multi-campus uh, locations. And I wrote in Nassau County. Well, one of the staff members crosses it out, Nassau County, and he says, he writes in Long Island. And everyone on the staff said, yeah, it should say Long Island, not Nassau County. It sounds too limited, too small. You're thinking too small, Steve. I'm thinking Nassau County is pretty big in and of itself. You know, we'll, we'll be okay there. But we changed it to Long Island. You know, I pass the baton now to Henry. And I think, okay, we have three locations. We've helped churches in other locations and things like that. I wonder how much land I didn't step into and acquire because of cowardice, because of it seemed to cost too much. And, you know, I, that's why when, when you know Jesus gives the parable of the guy who gets one talent, two talents, and five talents, I never thought of myself as the five talent guy. I'm the two talent guy. I'm not the one talent guy. I don't bury it in the sand and do nothing with it. I'm definitely more than that. But I'm not the five talent guy. So I was talking to a pastor out east. He's at True North. His name is Burt Crabb. Great guy. He had a youth group called Hearts of Fire which went gangbusters and became a church. The church became True North. And this church grew from a youth group to about 1,200 people. So I was hanging out with Burt Crabb about two years ago, three years ago, something like that. And uh, I, I said, Burt Crabb, how are things going? You know, how, how's the church going? Oh, it's going good. He says, I we think we have around 1,200 people now, and I'm good. I'm good. He says, I'm not like Brian. Now, Brian referring to is Brian McMillan from Center Point, Long Island. And this is what Bert said. Brian is planning on colonizing Mars. <laughs> and his point is he's unstoppable. You know, they're now on their sixth campus, maybe seventh. They have two more planned in the fall. Unstoppable. That's why I would say Brian is a ten talent, a five talent guy, you know, going to ten. I love hanging out with a Brian. But I look at, you know, this passage and I say number one Lord thank you that you fulfill your promises but number two Lord where have I not trusted you where there's more territory that possibly is out there for me what do you have in mind and so truth be told I'm not done there's still air in my lungs and when I like in fact right now Pastor Nathan and I are negotiating with, with, with Pastor Henry helping Lynbrook Baptist because they were without a pastor and we might take over the leadership of that church for a season while they look for a new pastor. New territory. Let's see what God has in store. Let's not put boundaries on that. The A few weeks ago when Pastor Henry and I toured a Catholic school that's gone under. You know, they just can't afford to stay open. And so they're looking to possibly rent we checked out new territory and see, I wonder, 
would God have us open a campus of Shelter Rock here? I don't know what the Lord has in mind, but I do know this. I don't want to have my map be on the right side of the screen. This far, and then, remember, Joshua told the tribes, now go finish the land. He tells them, this is your land, here are your cities, go take it. I think we'll go up north instead. Those are big, scary people there. Well, whoopee-doo. You know, it, it's just the way it is. I, I found out, somebody told me this. I do not know if it's true. But I visited one of our parishioners in Florida. And it was there one of our many people who have moved south. And this is what uh, this man, Terry, told me. That he read that 1,000 people a day are moving from New York to Florida. 1,000 a day. Now, I hope that's an exaggeration. I truly hope. But when I look at that, for us who remain <laughs> here, you could say, that means it's impossible to do ministry here. Hogwash. We can be a thriving, growing church in an area that people are moving away from. Why? Because our God is unstoppable. And you know what it means? It just means that we'll have, I mean, let's face it. How many people live on Long Island? Three million people live here, not including Queens and Brooklyn. I think we have enough people to work with by which we can grow a church and expect great things. So this passage, this, this paragraph is, is really a paragraph of hope, but a paragraph of judgment. It is what are you willing to believe about God? And are you willing to go there? So. Next week will be our last class, and here's what we're going to do. Pastor Nathan and I are both going to co-teach this class because I don't want to be left out even though it's his turn, so I'm stealing some of his thunder and being a part of teaching it too. Um, and with that, um, we will wrap up the book of Joshua. And we have that very exciting verse coming, which many of you might have on the wall of your house, who are you going to choose? But for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Um, choose ye this day whom you will serve. So that's coming up next week, and that'll wrap us up uh, for our class in Joshua. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we've had the opportunity tonight to study uh, your word and to look at the distribution of the land, but also be soberly reminded that you may have a present for us that we left unwrapped, that we never dug into, we never trusted you for. Father, we don't want to finish our race doing that. So I do pray, Lord, that you would help us see things from your perspective, that we would take the land because you fulfill all of your promises. We know this and we believe it by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you guys for coming and thank you guys for watching online. We'll check out your uh, comments in the uh, comment section later. Have a great evening.